today I'm going to talk to you about the first thing that is on the inside of the, the temple. We've talked about what David did outside the temple. We've talked about the four offices, the Son of Man, the Son of God, the substance sacrifice, and last week the King. Uh, and now we've moved inside the veil, and the first thing we're going to come to is a place of sacrifice. I'm going to show you some things about this process that, frankly, as the Holy Spirit began to unveil it to me, was a bit of a shock because it's different than what we have traditionally heard preached and taught concerning this. But I want you to see it today because when you see it, you will see God in the reality of how He desired to express Himself to man. So if you'll stand with me for just a second, we'll read from the book of Exodus, chapter 22, verses 1 and 2, and then we will proceed with the place of sacrifice. And thou shalt make an altar of shit of wood, five cubits long and five cubits broad. The altar shall be four square, and the height thereof shall be three cubits. And thou shalt make the horns of it upon the, upon the four corners thereof. His horns shall be of the same, and thou shalt overlay it with brass. Let's pray. Father, we thank you today for the word of God. We pray that you will minister to us. We pray that you'll open our eyes that we can see, and our ears that we can hear, and our heart that we can understand what the word of God is saying to us. Father, that then once we know it, we can apply it to our lives, and that it will make us stronger and deeper and that it will allow us to know you in a greater and better way. Now, Father, we just praise you today for the Holy Spirit. We thank you that when we come into your house, the Holy Spirit speaks to us and speaks to us. So we know that today the ministry of the Word will be given to us by the Spirit of God. For that, we're thankful. Now, bless us as we preach the Word. We'll give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. And you may be seated. All of my life I've heard taught about the sacrifice. And how the sacrifice was always a sacrifice for sin. And as I began to study this and deal with it in the spirit world, I saw something I've never seen nor heard nor had anybody preach about in my life. We focus so much on sin that we have lost the concept of what God was actually doing in Jesus Christ. We focus so much on forgiveness that we've lost the concept of what God was actually doing and this is what He was doing. When the brazen altar was given, God was not focusing on sin with the children of Israel. God was focusing on worship. Worship. Sin was one of five offerings that was given. There were five of them. The first offering was the burnt offering. The second offering was the meal offering. The third offering was the peace offering. The fourth offering was the sin offering, and the fifth offering was the trespass offering. So I begin to think about this. Why were there five offerings, and three of those offerings had nothing really to do with sin? And then it dawned on them. God's desire for you and me and everybody that comes to Him is that you come in worship to Him. That you seek Him in worship. That your idea of coming into the place of approaching God is not from just a position of having been saved, that there was a sacrifice made for your sin, and the guilt of sin brought you into the tabernacle. But the concept was that you come to the tabernacle because of a desire 
to worship the Creator that made you a living being. So when the brazen altar was given and the burnt offering was the thing that was done, they came to God in worship. God's desire for you coming into the house of God is not that you come in recognizing your sin, but that you come in recognizing the great God of the universe and bow before Him. And lay yourself out before Him. And forget about everything else but the great God of the universe. Casting all your care on Him. For He careth for you. Amen. See, that's the secret to this thing that we miss. God's desire for Israel was not to have the sin covered. Let me prove it to you. See, the sin offering was made one time a year. It's like the National Football League champion. You ever watch that? They call them the world champion. Then they play the game again next year. So every year they name a new world. They know such a thing as a world champion. It's a champion for 2019. Next year they're going to do it all over again. They're going to name a new world champion. And the next year, same thing all over again. World champion. It is such a thing. It is the champion for 2000, whatever it is, or the champion for 1956, or the champion for 1960. Sin in Israel was the same way. Every year, there was a sacrifice made that covered the sin of Israel for one year. For one year. Now, that tells me why it's so significant that what God was looking for in the tabernacle was a people to worship Him because sin was going to be redone every year, but worship was going to be done on a daily basis. Sin was only going to be covered one year at a time. Now we know that in the cross all of that changed. But the concept that God is striking through to the children of Israel and to every man, woman, boy, and girl who walks into the tabernacle, and we know the tabernacle was Paul's teaching in Hebrews 8 and 9, and it is the order of structure in heaven today because Jesus is the high priest of the tabernacle today. So God was trying to say to His people, come and worship Me. Come and praise Me. Come and give an offering because you are bowing before Me. Why did you come to church today? Did you come to church to give your offering of yourself to God? Did you come to church today out of duty? Why did you come to church? Because if you came to church for any other reason than to sacrifice yourself on an altar, a brazen altar if you will, and see God as the meter of all of your needs, you have come to church for the wrong reason. The brazen altar was a place of worship. When they took the, 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 the animal that they brought in, they took that animal and they did a number of things which I will talk about in a minute. But the concept was they were in complete surrender to the God that was, the Bible said, I, God speaking, will be your God and you will be my people. When they worshipped Him at the altar, they were saying, I surrender to your Lordship. I give everything I have to your Lordship. When they brought that animal back in the day, all they had was their flocks. All they had, all their work was, was their flocks. 
So when they brought that animal and they put that animal into the brazen altar and they strapped the animal to the horns, they were giving something that meant something. Would be like you giving a day's pay or a week's pay or a month's pay. They were giving something that they had raised. Think about this. They had taken care of. They had fed. They had checked meticulously to make sure that he qualified or she qualified to be used for this purpose. Now, I don't know about you, but I've had animals. The toughest days of my life had been whenever one of my animals died. That's tough. We had our little girl, Kelsey. She was a wonderful dog. That dog was so smart, she knew Pig Latin. We couldn't tell anything in our house. We'd try to talk to Pig Latin, and the dog would know exactly what we were saying. We would say, uh, 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 I would say to Sharon, I'd say, Aaron, say, are you, are you, are you, are you? Sharon would say, yes, yes. We would turn around, the dog would lead us to the door. <laughs> That's true. I would say, Aaron Shay, I am a onge ute ole ole up train. And the dog would beat me to the door, and I'd open the door and run to my truck because she knew that we were going camping. How she knew it, I don't know. <laughs> Smartest thing you ever saw, the hardest day of my life was the day that Sharon called me with the vet on the phone, and the vet virtually in tears telling me, we can't do anything more for her. The night before, I had picked her up in my arms because she couldn't walk any longer on her own. Her legs went straight out when she tried to stand up. I took her out on the backyard that night, and I sat her down, and I held her while she used the, the restroom outside. I picked her back up, and I carried her inside, and she was blind. Cataracts on both eyes. The last time I remember her being awake, I was holding her in my arms like this and she popped her head back and her eyes got great big and her nose went up in the air and she realized it was me. And she leaned over and licked my cheek. I went in and laid her down and her and I slept on the floor together that night and came in the bathroom. The next day, they told me she's no longer alive. Can't live. And I had to give consent for my dear puppy, who had gone every place in the world with me. So when they came to do what it was they were doing, church, this was not done just in a corner. This was something that meant something to them. It was something that they had taken care of. It was something that had touched their life. And now they were bringing that something to put it on an altar and say, this is me, God. I'm surrendering. I'm worshiping you. I'm loving you. I'm giving to you. And they would tie that animal to those horns. And then he would reach over and transfer himself to that animal. Then the owner, having one hand on his head and one hand on the knife, would look into the eye of the thing that said, I surrender my worship to you, God. And slit the throat. And the priest would catch the blood. And that man would say to God, I am yours. I totally surrender myself to you. There is nothing else in the world but you, God. 
I give myself to you. Then they would flay that animal. They would tear the skin off of that animal and cut the limbs off of that animal and put the animal back together and the priest would light the fire. And the animal would be consumed and turned into ashes. Now begin to inquire of the Lord why would there be such a total destruction of this blessed animal? Why? Why would that animal not only be killed, but then turned into complete ashes? And the Bible took it back to David and Job sitting in sackcloth and ashes where they had looked up and said, I surrender myself to you out of the ashes of destruction. You are my God. And through these ashes I have shown you that you're my church bearing? When you think about what you come to church carrying? What you come to church thinking? What you come to church getting away from instead of going to? Does it prick your heart today to think about the fact that sometimes you come to church for some solace to get away from what's outside the world the door, instead of coming to the house of God to surrender and be in one mind and one accord of worship to the God of the universe. Often, the world so ties us into a knot that we miss the fact that the reason they sacrificed was because they wanted God to know everything in my life is destroyed in order that I might know you. Total surrender. Total surrender. Total surrender. They gave the animal over to the priest. The priest tied it to the altar, to the horns of the altar. The blood was shed. For total surrender. Then the body was burned and ashes were caught, taken outside the gate to a special place. The total destruction of who you are. Oh, my Lord. Have you destroyed who you are? Or are you still holding on to your ideas? your values, your opinions, your ways. See, church, when God made this process of approaching him, the first thing that had to be done was that a man had to destroy himself. That was what he was saying. <laughs> that was what the process called for. The destruction of what I want. And the surrender of me to you because you are my God. Think about what I'm saying here. You are my God. You are my leader. You are my Lord. You are my keeper. You are my respite. You are my restorer. You are my coverer. You are everything to me. And I am your people. I am totally surrendered to whatever call you give me. See, that's what that scripture means. When he said, I will be your God and you will be my people. It meant that God was the high and exalted and lifted up Lord of glory and you were the people that were not just subject to him, but surrendered to him so that his will, his way, his idea, his calling could manifest itself in your life. The 
reason for the brazen altar was as a tool for worship. Israel would identify their offerings as a sign of worship to God. What offering are you identifying as a sign of worship to God? Well, preacher, I come to church. Coming to church is not a sign of worship. Coming to church is a sign that you know the way to get here. It's not a sign of worship. They knew the way to the tabernacle. But unless they brought the correct animal, and unless they processed the, the uh, offering in the correct way, the way to the tabernacle meant nothing to them. But when they processed the animal sacrifice in the correct way, they got into the place where they could say, I have worshipped God through the destruction of myself. Paul said, nevertheless, I am crucified with Christ. And the life that I now live, I live after the faith of the Son of God. That's what that means. Paul said, I died. That's what that means. That's where the concept came from. It came from the brazen altar where they took and died. They died through an animal. They died through the blood. They died through the ashes. They surrendered themselves totally to God. Have you surrendered yourself to God? Are you living a surrendered life? Are you living a life where God has everything in your life cast upon Him? Where He is your God and you are His people? Are you living there? That was the purpose of the brazen altar. So when they came in the door with their burnt offering, they were saying, I am crucified. I am dead. I am dead. And I am destroyed. And Paul put it into words that we could understand after the cross. Because the brazen altar identifies the cross. The brazen altar is the cross. It is the place where you die. It is the place where life changes. It is the place where you lay down yourself and go into ashes so that you sit in the middle of yourself and look around and say, these ashes show that I have come to simply rely totally, undoubtedly, and unmistakably on the God of heaven. The brazen altar. Now watch it now because I'm about to say something that will rattle your cage. The other nations who worshipped idols did, no, uh, did so with no obligation to sacrifice or give up anything in order to seek their God. The Ten Commandments said, Thou shalt have no other God before me. No idols before me. But all the nations around them had idols. They worshipped something such as the sun or the moon or the trees. What are you worshipping today? Oh, now preacher, you meddling. You done go for preaching and meddling now. What are you worshiping today? What about your world identifies that you have not surrendered yourself to God? All the nations around them have it. That's why the first thing that happened when they got into the tabernacle, they could not approach God until they laid down themselves. They couldn't approach God and bring in their, their idols. They couldn't worry about their houses or their lands or their cars or their children or their wives or their jobs. They couldn't worry about any of that. Why? Because God was their God and they were His people. All of those other things meant nothing. In the face of God, all of those other things meant nothing. What is your idol? That's why God started out the tabernacle with worship 
and they were taught to worship the God of heaven that had been the God that had delivered them out of all of their trouble and out of all of their captivity. But yet we get delivered out of sin and the cross is real to us and then we fall back into the trick of the devil and the deceit of the devil because he is a roaring lion is seeking to devour you by the idols that are created in your life. There they were in a land where idols were on every hand. And we know the story of Israel. They constantly went to the place, now watch me now, of no obligation. You can make a God out of anything. You can make a God out of anything. It doesn't matter. There's no obligation in worshiping the Son. There's no sacrifice or offering in worshiping your house. There's no sacrifice or offering in worshiping your husband or your children. There's no obligation in that. There's no redeeming quality in that. It may be a good thing to do, but when it becomes the object of your worship, my friend, you are out of place in the process of the divine design of God, and He shows it to us right in the temple. But the people around worship God. So Israel had to be taught how to worship. Now, why do you think music became a prevalent part of the church? Any idea? Because we have to be taught and brought into worship. We have to be led into worship. That's why music became a part of it. Because the teaching of worship and the teaching of surrendering ourselves to worship was the key and is the key to getting the atmosphere charged so the Word of God can come forth and change our hearts. Music is essential because it breaks down our barriers, of course, unless we get caught in it being what we're worshiping. We get caught in worshiping the tune. We get caught in having our body buy in to the tune or the beat. Music's concept was that it would bring our hearts into a position where we could see God and surrender to God so that we could be open and available and ready and have ourselves destroyed and in ashes so that when the Word of God came forth, it could prick our heart and we could see through the Holy Ghost how to apply it. Israel would be taught the worship of God. Now watch this. And that worship of God was the ingredient. Now watch what I'm about to say. Worship is the ingredient that knit them together with their God and identified them with Him. It knit them together. When they transferred themselves to the animal and the blood was shed, it knit them together with God. And when the burnt offering was held, the Bible said it was a sweet smelling savor in the very nostrils of God because He saw their worship. Does God see your worship? Does God hear your worship? Does God, is God listening to your worship as if you were burning an altar of incense, a brazen altar sacrifice before Him? If not, then your worship needs to get corrected. The whole concept was to be taught how to worship. The brazen altar was a place close to the entrance. Why? Because the whole idea was when you come in, you come in worshiping me. You come in praising me. You come in with a song in your heart. 
You come in with a praise on your lips. You come in with an attitude of gratitude to Almighty God. You come in to the very first thing you see and lay yourself down and destroy who you are and destroy what you want and destroy what you need and lay yourself on an altar to be totally ready to see the mighty God of heaven. People in We come in with so many ideas. We come in with so many needs. We come in with so many wants. We've been taught. Tell it all to Jesus. Tell it all to Jesus. Oh, He'll give it to you. Oh, He's got so many great promises just waiting on you. And we sit around and we wonder why aren't those promises happening for me? Well, the answer is you're not going to get to the promise until you come through the worship. It will work that way. God is not a backwards God. He does not put the beginning in the end or the end in the beginning. When He came into the tabernacle, He said, Come in and come to me with worship. You'll find me in the Holy of Holies, but come to me with a worship that surrenders who you are. There were five sacrifices I've already told them to you. But I want to go through them real quick so you'll know what they meant. The first sacrifice was the burnt offering. That was for surrender. Now I'm going to tell you this. In these five sacrifices, Jesus Christ was all in all. He covered every one of them. He was there. He was complete in every one of them. First sacrifice was total surrender. That happened in the garden. That happened where Jesus said, nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. Yeah. He surrendered himself. Then there was the grain offering, which identified the relationship of service and love to God. The grain offering was the bread of life. Something had to be given. In the garden, the Bible said they came and they wanted to fight for it. Remember that? Jesus said, put your swords away. And that Son of God was given into their hands. Then there was the peace offering, which was the offering of sacrifice. That offering for Jesus took place whenever they slashed His body and beat Him and ripped His back with the cat of nine tails. He was the complete peace offering. The blood was shed. He was complete all in all. And then there was the sin offering. The Bible said he was beaten outside or sacrificed outside the gate. He was hung on a cross on Mount Calvary so that the sin of man could be laid upon him. So that the world, he could be made something he was not. So that you could be made the righteousness of God. And then there was the trespass offering. The trespass offering was a great offering. It was an offering of restitution. It was an offering of satisfaction. Jesus hung on the cross and said these words, It is finished. The satisfaction of sin and the trespass of man is complete in me. And then the Bible said there was a fifth part. And we find that in this. Jesus, or Isaiah said, He was wounded for my transgression. He was bruised for my iniquity. The chastisement of my peace was upon Him. And by His stripes we're healed. And then the fifth part struck in. And He said He was stricken. He was stricken with a plague. He gave me more than even the, the four things that Isaiah identified that we preach forever. He was stricken for you. He was oppressed. He was judged. He was grieved. He was sorrowful. He was completely immersed in the plan of sin so that you could be free. Yeah. He didn't give you just the four things Isaiah said in Isaiah 53. If you look at Isaiah 53, 8, 7, and 8, you'll find it there. The fifth part. He gave you more. 
He made amends for more than was required so that you could become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Amen. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live by the faith of the Son of the crucified. The darling of heaven, crucified, worthy is the Lamb. Hallelujah. He's worthy. Almost all things are purified, purged by the blood. Now we know why. Grain was not purged by the blood. The first burnt offering. The grain offering and the peace offering are worship offerings, church. Therefore, you to worship God. Now watch. Therefore, the brazen altar is a place of sacrifice, a place of complete surrender. Now watch it now, because this will impact your worship if you listen. This will change your life if you listen. It's the place where things are lifted up. When they came to the brazen altar, it didn't have steps, it had a ramp. And they would walk up carrying this, up, consider this a ramp. They would walk up carrying this sacrifice. It's a place where things are lifted up. When you come into the house of God and you lift up your voice, you're lifting up your sacrifice. You're lifting up something before God. When you come in and you sit on your hands and you say nothing, you do nothing, you worship nothing, you say nothing, and you don't give any honor, then you're cheating yourself out of the opportunity to worship. I don't care what the song is. The song is not relevant. Watch it now. It's who you're worshiping that's relevant. The place where man is forced to identify the object of his redemption. When you come into this house, you should be worshiping the object of your redemption. What is that? High and lifted up, Jesus, Son of God. Watch it. The darling of heaven, crucified. Worthy is the Lamb. That's the object of your worship. You should come in here every Sunday, every Wednesday, looking to Jesus, the author and the finisher of my faith. Yes. Worthy is the Lamb. High and lifted up, Jesus' Son, of God, the darling of heaven, crucified, worthy is the Lamb, worthy is the Lamb, high and lifted up, Jesus, Son of God, the darling of heaven, crucified, worthy is the Lamb, worthy is the Lamb, worthy is the eyes of the sacrifice. It's the place of reconcile to your role. To your role in the death of the sacrifice. Now we can understand what John 12, 22 said. Now watch it now. He said, and I, if I be lifted up. Here came the man bearing the animal. 
coming up the ramp and lifting up the sacrifice. And I, if I be lifted up, I'll draw all men unto me. Yeah. Now we see that. The altar is a place where man calls upon the Lord. The altar is a man, place where the man calls. And the question is to you today. Are you coming to the house of God to call upon the Lord? Are you bringing praise to worship God? Because in your praise you will call upon the Almighty God. Bow your heads and close your eyes. Now, Father, I have introduced this today to your people. I know that my heart is pricked, and I feel sure that their hearts are pricked. Because we have made the worship of God so many different things, and we forgot these things. That is my personal, genuine surrender to you. My personal turning away from idols and things and people to you. My personal relationship to you. My life in you. Giving up what I want. Giving up the things that I think make me happy so that I can see you high and lifted up. High and lifted up. And I, if I be lifted up, Father, I ask you today to allow your people to lift up Jesus in their lives. To lift up Jesus in their lives so that they can be a worshiper. A worshiper. There is a difference, God, and you know, between a follower and a worshiper. Followers can follow from afar, but a worshiper walks into the tabernacle in the outer court, lays himself upon the brazen altar. There at the brazen altar surrenders to the total destruction of himself so that that individual can be a sweet smelling savor. A sweet smelling savor in the nostrils of all my If that's what you want today and you're willing to lay down your life, you're willing to transfer your life in the complete surrender of God, complete worship of God, complete casting all your care on Him for He cares for you, then I want you to stand at your feet and I want you to raise your hands and I want you to begin to worship. I want you to begin to worship this King. I want you to begin to worship this Savior. I want you to begin to worship this God. I want you to open your mouth and begin to surrender yourself to God and begin to understand that worthy is the Lamb. He is more than worthy of your surrender and your praise and the opening of your mouth. The Bible said open your mouth wide and I will fill it. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Thank you for the price you paid. Oh, God. It was you that I laid upon that altar. It was you who I transferred my sin. It was you who spoke our sin. It was you who was totally destroyed for me. Oh, God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for the nail-pierced hands. Yes. Put me in your crimson clothes. 
so the Lord I know it's your forgiveness and your in praise you are my God and I am your people say it the Lord see it on the throne worship him with you worship him today oh you desire you are undivided worship
So what did you do? You surrender. What did you do? You surrender yourself. You surrender yourself. You know why? Because he is high and lifted up. He's Jesus, the Son of God, the darling of heaven crucified. And he's worthy of your surrender. He's worthy. Change your life. When they transferred themselves to the head of the animal, it changed their life. How do you know? Because what they transferred it to was destroyed. And the ashes were there to show. I want you to have ashes in your life of the old man. I want you to live so that you can say with Paul, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live by the faith of the Son of God. Amen? Amen. Pastor Mike, we are the living sacrifice. We are. That's Amen. in this message. I'll get to it next week. <laughs> <laughs> next week, I'm going to tell you what Paul taught Hallelujah. from Romans chapter 12. Yeah. I have to finish this. This is too great, too important. Awesome. For me to move on to the next before I get this totally done. Give the Lord a hand clap of praise. We love you. We appreciate you. We thank you for being here. We thank David and Tara for their work in Sunday school. Yes. Give them a big round of applause. I thank you for coming. Someone said to me one time, said, how many you got? And I said, well, we go somewhere between 30 and up to 45 or so. I said, whoa, that's a small church. Yeah, it is. I don't okay. care. What I care about is that when I come here, the anointing of God is in this place. Amen. The anointing of God is in this place. When the anointing of God is in this place, the people that sit under the anointing are the people that get the blessing of God. And that's where you sit. Glory. That's why I'm blessed. Amen? Amen? Well, glory to God. I'll tell you what we're going to do now. We're going to dismiss. I'm going to let you go. <laughs> but I'm going to challenge you to go out that door and be different than you were when you came in. Amen. And I'm going to challenge you to come back in here Wednesday night and hear the, the, the ending of, of Juliana's teaching. We appreciated Blake's work this past week. We know you enjoyed him. And then come in here next Sunday with an attitude first yeah. when you hit the door that you have been in worship and that you're going into worship. And when you come through the door, it's the gate that is bringing you into the worship of Almighty God. Amen. He is the great God Almighty. Amen. 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 Amen.